Rebecca Bradford Andrew grew up close to nature and wild animals. In the 30s, her grandparents settled in a small Amerindian village in the north of British Columbia. Rebecca was raised according to the traditional values of the Taltan nation and has maintained very strong connections with the First Nations way of life. All of the people who taught me basically my ethics and the things that I know, they are all First Nation people, the First Nation community. We work together to, uh, to make the, the children strong and to teach what you know and have the good things that you know passed on to your children. After getting a degree in biology, Rebecca sought a job that would allow her to raise her children far from the city while maintaining close contact with the animal world. A wildlife sanctuary close to Whitehorse caught her attention, and from her first day, Rebecca became a surrogate mother to three baby wapitis. I had, I was the mother of three young elk calves. They'd imprinted on me because we pulled them from their mothers. They had trouble giving birth, and so we had to take them away from their mothers and raise them by the bottle. It was just a full-time job. <laughs> you know, they just followed me everywhere, and I was feeding the animals, and they'd follow along behind. And I was the mother, yes. So, yes, my own children I find much easier to raise than the baby elk. <laughs> I was like, oh, if this, is, if this is the way that it's going to be, I think I'll never have children. Rebecca is in charge of educational activities in the Yukon Wildlife Preserve. Extending over an area of about three square kilometers, the reserve accommodates wildlife in habitats very similar to the natural environment of Yukon. This, this spot on the preserve has significance in that it is, um, it's a special place. It's a place where you can actually see all of the different habitats that are on the preserve. More than just a, a, a place where all of our northern animals live, it's also it's sort of, it's a, the whole place is, a, is an edu it's educational tool. The mission was to set up a place here in Yukon where we can raise people's awareness of wildlife in terms of the habitat and the environment that the animals survive in and show how to protect the animals and their environment. Water, shelter, space, food, water, shelter, space, habitat, habitat is where it's at. Just think about Remy Roden coordinates educational programs for the Ministry of the Environment. He helps teachers to assimilate ideas about the wildlife and environment of Yukon into their curriculum. Something that makes the reserve here very unique is the authenticity of the natural habitat. For example, the large cliffs are perfect for mountain sheep. There are also mountain goats, mule deer and buffalo. And the conditions here are wet, which means you also find moose and wapiti. It's really special to be able to see them close up in their natural habitat. And it's not like cramming them into a zoo. Among the animals typical of Yukon, there is one that Rebecca is particularly fond of, the stone sheep. She first came into contact with it in her childhood while hunting with her grandfather. As the animal observes them, Rebecca remembers an inexplicable feeling of communicating with the mind of the animal. The mountain creatures are, they're just very 
um, well adapted for life in the north. And the things that, that my grandfather taught our family to, the qualities that we were taught to, to admire and to emulate are qualities that are mimicked in, in, in a, a stone sheep. So, for example, having good eyes or to be in good shape or um, being tough in the bush. Rebecca first learnt to understand the behaviour of wild animals through contact with her Amerindian family and later while studying biology. You have to really be able to read their behaviour and read their body language. That being said, you're never 100% sure. If they're trapped, then they will run at you and try to hit you with their horns. But um, this guy has enough space that he can move around us. And I don't think, I mean, you never know for sure that he would make contact, but it's always good to be safe. And if you can make yourself appear a little larger than you are, it's a little safer still. Rebecca goes regularly to the forest with her children. It is a way for her to teach them respect for nature and to pass on values that she considers important. The children also accompany her in August every year when she spends a month in the forest with her Amerindian family. During this period, Rebecca lives from hunting, fishing and picking wild fruit. Another thing that I think is happening in our society is I think our lifestyles are becoming very sedentary. And kids aren't walking and exerting themselves and hiking and really pushing hard and, you know, hurting a little bit, you know, they're, and, and they're very uncomfortable with any kind of um, discomfort, you know, they're very uh, afraid of it. So that's the, one of the things I'm teaching my kids. As a child, um, we were taught to do this, to be out in the bush from a very early age. And, and if you wanted to go with your family, you had to not be too much trouble. Set up a fly uh, with, a, with a tarp, sort of an old, old style, and, um, and like a tea pole to make tea with. And you set up a couple tents and the kids, everybody sleeps on the ground. Our families have always relied on animals for their survival. And that's why we celebrate the animal, is because it helps us survive. It's a very reciprocal relationship. In return, we make sure that the, that the animal populations, the moose populations, and the sheep populations are healthy by monitoring them and keeping an eye and snaring wolves and, and, um, and trying to, trying to uh, keep the predator populations as down as possible. It's reciprocity. Autumn is coming to a close as the days get shorter and the cold weather gradually settles in. For some mammals, it is the start of the mating season. Normally they're quite happy just to lie and, and in their pastures and, and be fat and lazy, but this time of year their genetic survival depends on their their ability to find someone to meet with. Today, Rebecca is accompanying Jason on his rounds as he looks after the wildlife. She is particularly fond of autumn because it brings an opportunity to observe hierarchies being established among the animals. You can actually see them having 
you know, almost a conversation about who's going to be the boss. You can see what's an alpha male and a, a beta male, which is a second in command, and then all of the ones underneath him and how there's this hierarchy gets formed. It's really significant in a muskox. Hey girls, how you guys doing today? So that's the thing about caribou, is they need the leaves, they need to eat the leaves. And so we always have to flip the hay over, like Jason's doing. And they've been going through lots of hay, have they? Yeah, well lately, I don't know if it's because of their rut or whatever. They don't eat so much? No, they don't eat so much. The caribou is particularly well adapted to a Nordic environment. Its broad feet means it doesn't sink into the marshlands or snow, and its short, stocky body is well adapted to the freezing conditions. But it's for very different reasons that the natives of the Yukon attach particular importance to the caribou. The Aboriginal people in the north believe that the caribou is a very special animal just because it used to be the primary food source um, before the moose came. The moose have only been in the north um, in, in our area for the last you know, couple hundred years, 150 years. Rebecca's life, like that of the indigenous people, has always moved to the rhythm of the seasons. Despite the very short winter days, the animals on the reserve have to be cared for as females prepare to give birth in spring. Rebecca is also involved in a range of wildlife and natural habitat management programs, and she sits on a committee that includes members of the First Nations. In the north, I, I think in the Yukon in particular, um, it's one of the few jurisdictions that um, openly and actively solicits uh, traditional knowledge in their decision making. So um, for that reason, I just think it's such a very cool place. And some people say we're way behind the times, and some people say we are way ahead for that reason. A census of animal populations is carried out not only through extended studies over a 10-year period, but also by consulting the indigenous peoples on the ground. In the Yukon, we do that, the 10-year study, but we also go out and we, have, we hire people that go and talk to First Nation people. They say, have you noticed in the last 20, 25 years, are there more caribou, are there less caribou? Do you see lots of calves this year? Did you not see so many calves? So you listen, you talk to all the people that are actually on the land, and you use that and put it together with your other data, like your hard scientific data, and you make your decision based on those two. In my mind, that I mean, anybody that's spent any time on the land and, and has a family that, that works on the land, they know exactly what's happening out there. That's where traditional knowledge is extremely valuable. Every day on the reserve brings something new and unexpected. Today, Rebecca must take in a bald eagle found ensnared by a trapper. Maria, the reserve's veterinary surgeon, examines the animal. Its wings are infected. She could tell they were infected from the odor and the greenish color. So she's going to find some medication to treat it. It knows what it's doing. It can still feed itself. So I think there's a good chance it will recover well. You have to look at this as more than just a job. It's a way of life. You're on standby 24 hours a day. It's hard for workers here to take a vacation.
The whelping season has just begun, and 12 youngsters have already been born. This female musk ox is now in labor. It is rare to be able to attend the birth of animals, as females usually give birth during the night. Rebecca seizes a rare opportunity to film the event. I was watching the cow be giving birth, and I see she's in labor, so I called Rebecca. So we could, so we're going to film it and see how exciting it will be to show people a birth of the animal. So we are here, we are filming it, and the cow is just turning away and goes away from the calf and didn't even lick it off. So, oh, well, we, we were waiting for that the most exciting, the bonding part, and it didn't happen. So we all upset about it and they're kind of watching her being abandoned for. The cool spring weather makes the situation worse. As the mother seems to have abandoned the calf, Maria and Rebecca are concerned for its survival. I learned how, how similar humans are to animals. We have a lot of similar um, impulses, but, but also how an, wild animals, don't, you cannot control them. And that's what I learned. You, know, you have to let things go sometimes. I think it's an important lesson for people to learn that you, know, that you need to not always try to be in control of everything. You know, let, let it go. Life will happen no matter what. In addition to the musk calf, a baby mountain goat has also been abandoned. No way are Rebecca and Maria about to let them die. As newborn goats need to be kept warm, Maria has to take the kid in during the night. A few weeks later, Apart from lacking a companion, the young musk ox is doing just fine. Come on. Come on. Rebecca and Maria decide to put the young goat in the same enclosure as the musk ox. Despite their difference in size, the two animals seem to be living happily together. always are wild animals. So you can walk into a pasture day after day after day for 60 times, and the 61 time you walk in that pasture and the animal comes after you. It's a, it's a, a great learning experience on how you cannot control a wild animal, ever. It doesn't matter if you raised it from a baby. Even those three babies that I raised, they when they got to be older, they're very unpredictable, very difficult to be in the pasture with. You should have your partner there with a bucket. Reach out and get your aquatic plant samples and put the samples in the bucket. The coming of spring heralds the return of visiting school children. For Rebecca, these activities are important because they give her an opportunity to pass on her wildlife knowledge to youngsters and to teach them respect for the natural world around them. That's one of the things I see happening with the kids here is, is if they're educated and they're getting to be connected to the land and they go out to school to get their formal education, then they're kind of, you're marrying both your traditional knowledge and your scientific knowledge in one person, which I find a very valuable thing. See, when I'm a... It's much more effective when you have direct experience with objects, trees and wood, as opposed to just looking and listening to someone speak. So the idea is to have them immerse themselves in their environment. Does anybody know what this is? It is the fur from a musk ox, actually. The really super, super soft stuff. It's very fine and very warm. There is no warmer fiber anywhere on earth. That's muskox and this is bison. 
Among the activities that Rebecca and Remy have developed is a time machine. This activity draws upon the knowledge of First Nations elders to raise awareness of the infinite resources that nature offers. Okay. This is something called Yero. When we were developing the different stations, we thought it would be really nice to, to teach students the, um, the, the ways that the old, old people, that the First Nation people used to survive. So what about a spoon? If you couldn't run to the store and buy a spoon, what's a good thing that you could use to... A stick, you could use a stick. You could use something like this. Chief Joseph was a leader of his First Nations clan, and he always taught his people respect for the land. Every creature has a spirit, every plant a living soul. What a magic way to live a life, and it made his people whole. It's about realizing that we are a part of nature, and that we have to act, not just say that it's a good idea to save wildlife. It's about life, and changing the way we live a little. Anything we can do to achieve that. I don't think I've, I could ever work in a place where I, I wasn't uh, doing something for the greater good. Um, you know, everybody wants to save the world. <laughs> but this is one of those things, uh, my own personal motivation, I'm an, I'm an educator and a biologist, and I believe that um, if you can connect people to the land, to the universe, you just can make people a little more aware of their impact on, on the earth and on their environment. It just makes makes the world sort of a better place. For I know that there are limits and we can't go on.